I am, I'm going to approach this presentation, uh, I try to, in three different sections. And the first one is, yeah, it's a little bit like shameless marketing, I guess. I'm going to tell you about uh, our, our vineyard, which is a 40-acre farm. Uh, and it's uh, just, well, it's in the hills outside of the Shehalem Valley, above the Shehalem Valley, outside of Newburgh. So it's about 14 miles from here as the crow flies, something like that. Um, and as the name would imply, the vineyards, uh, and there's about 29 acres of vineyard, are surrounding an old brick house that was built back in 1928. Uh, and that's where my wife and myself and our yellow Labrador uh, live. And I started planting Pinot Noir first in, uh, in 1990. Um, and the first thing that I did, actually, once we got the plants in the ground, was I went to an organization uh, here in Oregon that's called Oregon Tilth and registered the farm, the entire 40 acres, for organic production. And, and so we grew successfully, really, um, uh, and, and grew the vineyards, too, uh, on an organic basis for about a dozen years or so. And we are still organic certified today. We did, though, move on from the organic program into a full-blown biodynamic and I'll approach that in the next section of what I have to say. Um, the winery on the farm is a 1931 vintage horse barn, uh, and it too is right beside the brick house, kind of in the middle of the vineyards. And we are um, an estate winery, which means that we grow all of our own fruit. It's an important term, and it's one that really is important to us because uh, by growing all of our own fruit, I'm the winemaker, I, I have more control over what is actually happening once we get that fruit in. I, I try, as we pick grapes, to pick in a way that optimizes each of those uh, different aspects. Because, for example, this year when it was really warm, our north face produced some really beautiful fruit. It wasn't as warm. We could leave it out. Uh, I mean, the, the vineyard site wasn't as warm. It doesn't get as much sun on the north side. So we could leave it out a little bit longer. Uh, and, and get more flavor development and it had brighter acidity, natural acidity, and then blend that with some of the warmer sites in the vineyard uh, that had earlier flavor development and that we had picked earlier than the North Face. So we, I've learned, I guess, over the years to work with my vineyard in that way. And I think of it in a way, it's kind of like um, a winemaker who's uh, fishing the same stream uh, every, every year. We're going, we're fishing different pools, trying to, to catch fish at different times, same stream, but in different ways. Compared to the conventional vineyards that you, that you might more normally see, um, we don't use uh, any chemicals as an organic grower, any kind of chemical herbicides. And so we've got a lot of stuff growing in the floor of the vineyard, under the vines and in the rows. We've got wild grasses, we've got flowering plants, we've got clover, horsetail, we've got blackberries, our friends, the blackberries. And we, we have to control all of that by mowing and hoeing, which we do mechanically, uh, rather than using chemicals. As soon as I started planting vines at Brickhouse in May of 1990, uh, I began the process of certification, as I said. Uh, and it was largely for the environmental reasons. You know, what it really means is that since that time, uh, we have never applied any agrochemicals uh, to our vines or our soil that are synthetically compounded. Uh, and we farmed successfully this way for the first dozen years or so. Uh, but over time, you know, I started thinking about some other considerations. This is what happens when you live in the middle of 40,000 grapevines. It makes you think about what you're doing. Um, 80 tons of fruit, like we harvested just two weeks ago, uh, represents a massive gross extraction of nutrients from the soil. You know, all that potassium, all that nitrogen, all that phosphorus, all, all the micronutrients, you're just taking it right out. It's like mining, extracting this stuff in the form of the grapes. And so I got very curious about composting. And that led me to think uh, about biodynamics. Integral to a biodynamic system uh, is, is compost. It's one of the pillars. Uh, and so as a result, we started making compost. We still make compost. Uh, and 
and we use that as our main nutrient source. What we now call biodynamics, that's just kind of the modern word. Um, the practices have been in, in practice for many, many centuries uh, in many, many different cultures over, over time. A biodynamic farmer has several pillars. One is building compost in a certain way, and you take that all that the remnants of what you do on the farm and you build it into compost piles and you basically cook it. Another, uh, actually it's sort of a two-part pillar, if you will, is the use of these preparations that Rudolf Steiner described in these lectures back in 1924. Uh, the preparations are basically natural uh, teas, natural substances that are derived from certain plants, um, yarrow, dandelion, very familiar common plants. Um, they're collected and they're, they're aged in certain ways and then teas are made from them. And we take those teas and we spread them. Some of them we spread on the ground, we spray out of the back of a small tractor. Some of them we spray on the leaves of the canopy once the leaves are out at certain times of year. Uh, and there are, there are basically two very important preparations that are the pillars, the two pillars. One is they call BD501, Biodynamic 501. Now, Biodynamic 500 is the famous one. You've probably all heard, or maybe you've heard, about the cow horn, and you take manure and you put it in a cow horn and you bury that cow horn in the ground for uh, over the winter, uh, generally about this time of year. You leave it in the ground for six months, and when you dig it up, you'll find that much like the compost in your compost pile, the, the manure, what was manure in that, uh, in that horn, has also been transformed into a really beautiful form of compost. It has no smell. I mean, the, actually, it has a beautiful smell. It smells like kind of rich soil. You know, it's, it's, uh, it looks like uh, rich compost. It's kind of got the texture of coffee grounds, if you will. And it produces a really beautiful substance, which we then make a tea out of, and we spray on the soil, the ground, uh, in the vineyard. That tea enlivens what's already there, the, the soil microbiology, the microbes in the soil. Uh, and it, it basically wakes them up, if you will. Uh, and they get started. They're, they're critical to feeding the plants. It's the microbes that actually deliver nutrient into the root systems of the plant. Uh, and, and obviously, uh, a healthy, rich microbiology in the, in the soil is going to produce healthier plants. And that's, that's the thinking behind this form of biodynamics. Biodynamic 501, the other preparation, uh, is a quartz crystal that's ground, very finely ground, and aged, also in the ground, and then put into a tea and sprayed on the leaves of the plants. And the notion here is that in the same way that 500 enlivens the soil microbes, 501 enlivens the photosynthesis and the respiration of the leaves of the plants. All of this is done in with an eye to the seasons. Uh, the, the 500 for the ground is done in the spring. The 501 for the leaves, of course you have to have leaves, so that's later in the summer. And that then leads you into keeping an eye on the calendar. And there is a biodynamic calendar. If you if you look at it, it will tell you uh, whether this is a fruit day or a leaf day or a root day. There are four different kind of days in the biodynamic calendar, and it, and it is believed that the, they are days where uh, various astronomical position of, of the moon and the planets uh, enhance the work of these four different parts of a growing plant. At Brick House, we keep it real practical because we've got to pick fruit when we can and when the fruit is ready and when the weather allows us and when the manpower is there. So we, we keep an eye on the calendar, but we don't uh, obsess with it, if you will. It's, uh, we really try to, to keep a pretty down-to-earth approach. In a nutshell, you know, what, what we now call biodynamics takes organic farming a, a, another step. Um, it's without the use of agricultural chemical, chemicals. The farmer uh, is trying to push the whole living system. The soil, the microbes that inhabit it, the plant roots, the leaves, the immune system of the plant, push it to be stronger, push it to be healthier, 
and more efficient at what it does. So you're not really, you're not adding a lot of stuff, you're just enhancing, enriching what's already there. What I'm really talking about, or trying to talk about, is that biodynamics creates kind of a whole different way of looking at life in the vineyard. I mean, you really do just look at your vineyard in a different way. Much of it is perception, and, and the way that you choose to approach growing your plants. Um, an important principle uh, is, and it's really an important one, and, and kind of profound, uh, is viewing the farm or the vineyard as a living organism. Viewing it as a whole. Um, it's a whole system in which all these various parts are interrelated. And that is, for example, the compost pile is related to the harvesting of the grapes. Um, and, the, and the vineyard is directly related to what, what we do as the human element on the farm, to the decisions we make about how the vineyard is going to grow and what it needs. So why, we, why in the world would we do all of this and see the world this way? Well, it has to do with the view that healthy vineyards produce healthy, delicious, age-worthy wines. Don't, if you don't have healthy vineyards, uh, by just feeding plants specific amounts of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, micronutrients, you know, that's, that's not going to get you there. Good health entails approaching the whole plant, the whole farm, the whole system. Lots of foods reflect where they came from. Walla Walla sweet onions, for example, Boardman melons out in eastern Oregon, for example, and even maple syrup from different forests in Vermont, I'm told, have different flavors. But in my opinion, none of these do such a good job in delivering a sense of place of terroir as wine does, especially Pinot Noir. It, it is a shining mirror to everything that happens to it from the time you start growing it until the time it goes into the bottle. And, you, and so our objective is to keep that mirror clean so that it, it, it then reflects all the stuff that our farm is. And that's why we do what we do, to deliver our bottles, in our bottles, a taste, an experience of the place where we live, where we work, and that we love. So in my book, that's really the winemaker's dream. That's, that's why I do what I do.